Hello everybody, it's Phil from One Wall Studio here once again doing another Amp Sim review slash tutorial. So instead of reading that manual, hey, listen to me and watch as I go through all of the things you need to know about this particular Amp Sim. This time we're talking about the Laney Ironheart Amp Sim from Aurora DSP. A couple of things that are important to mention here is aside from the global experience of the UI, there are a couple of things that are actually standalone edition only. So if you have the standalone edition. It should be under Ironheart here. Here's a couple of differences between the plug-in edition and the standalone. So here in the standalone, you'll notice that you actually have a lot more options than you have on the plug-in edition. For one thing, you have a metronome here that you can actually use to keep time. You have a recording button with a folder that you can actually open the recordings and take a look at. By default, it saves to on Windows, Documents, Aurora DSP, Ironheart Recordings. And whilst you're there, see that there's far more settings here. So you can actually set the device type with all of the different API options here and set your inputs, set your outputs. You can test, you can adjust the sample rate, you can go and set MIDI options, as well as adjusting the buffer size and doing all of that fun IO stuff. So the settings on the standalone are a lot more cohesive and uh, unique because you're not going to be using it in context of a DAW. So all of these things allow you to cut out the middleman on the DAW and more or less get you started. It also has a unique feature called the Studio Environment Simulation. Now this is standalone only. The idea here is that the Studio Environment Simulation will replicate a uh, acoustic conditions of a professional studio environment in headphones. So if you're playing in headphones, it'll emulate a room basically. So you can hear what it would sound like if it was played uh, through a set of speakers as opposed to being straight into your headphones. That way you can make adjustments to your tone that should translate to when it goes into a DAW, but I can't vouch for that as I've only used it in the DAW. So as far as I can tell, those are the only differences between standalone mode and VST mode or AAX mode if you're using it in Pro Tools. Aside from the metronome, the recording capabilities and the virtual studio environment button, everything else is identical as far as I am aware. So with that in mind, let's go through the rest of this in the plugin. So first things first, going along the top, you'll notice that there's still the about section. I have version 1.0 made by Aurora DSP, copyright 2024, the Laney Ironheart. So after that, you have the save button, which allows you to save a preset. You only really have a chance of clean lead and rhythm sections, and then you can name it and it'll save it into the preset menu here. From there, you can get to the default settings. You can go to the clean, which will then have any user presets, like I've already saved two to the clean. It'll have built-in presets from both Aurora DSP and artists, and then the user folder, and then the same with rhythms. So Aurora DSP's rhythms, artist rhythms, and user rhythms. Not very many options compared to uh, some others, but you still have a lot of presets out of the box. Now you can also do the same thing that you're able to do with some others, Amp Sims, where you can actually scroll left and right and it'll go to all of the preset menus. So you can see that we're currently down at the lead menu. I'm going to go back to the clean user, fill breakup. There we go. So now it should have the exact same settings as I had earlier. You can also delete a preset, which I do not want to do because I like this preset. You can undo or redo any particular choices that you've made. You can see your license, which this one shows that I have my license active because I purchased it. You have the mono and stereo switch. So the mono stereo switch is actually an input switch. So it'll switch between just looking at one particular input versus looking at two inputs. Now this will allow you to do a stereo signal into it with like a left and a right if you have stereo selected. Otherwise, it'll only play one of the tracks. It doesn't sum to mono. It's just just looking at the left channel as if on the track itself, it was only sending input left or input one. So that could be a potential frustration if you don't know to switch it from mono to stereo because by default, it's going to be in mono. After that, you have the MIDI button, which allows you to go through and assign any potential knob or switch to MIDI 
including preset switching, bypass of every individual module. You can adjust the inputs and outputs with MIDI. There's a lot you can do here with the MIDI options. And all of it can be assigned with a basic MIDI learn where you press the button, MIDI learn, and then you go through and you assign it to a specific MIDI control. You have this tuner here, which allows you to mute while you're tuning, which could be potentially useful for you. And a little bit of a reference thing here that allows you to go down to 370 hertz and up to 520 hertz. I like to keep it at 440, but that's a really wide range of potential tuning reference points. So they really did think of a lot with that tuner. Below the tuner, on the left you see that there's an input signal meter. Let me show you how that works here. It'll bounce up and down and it'll show you if you're clipping too much. So if I were to crank the input on these uh, tracks here, you'd see it would turn red to indicate that it's too loud. And the same thing happens on the output. If I were to crank the output too much, it would turn red to signal that to us as well. The input and output meters are very useful at a glance just to make sure that you're getting proper gain in and proper gain out. Next to that, you actually have a performance and quality switch. In performance mode, you'll see that your CPU usage actually decreases. So right now, my CPU usage on this channel is at about 0.4%. And if I switch it to quality mode, it jumps up to about 0.67%. Now that doesn't seem like much, but then again, I have a very powerful CPU. So the modeling becomes more accurate in quality mode. If you have a not so great processor, then switching to performance might give you more gains. I, on the other hand, have a really top of the line processor for studio production stuff. So it's probably not gonna show much of a difference for me. It's likely just gonna be around, you know, a fraction of a percent, really. Bear that in mind when you get this plugin, it does have a performance mode if you have a lower powered rig. I will keep it in quality for the time being because I can afford to, you know, basically throw away cycles. <laughs> Up next, let's go along the bottom of the plugin. You'll notice that there is an input knob here currently set to zero. So you can actually correct the input value from the level of the plugin. So if you were to be going into the red, you might actually just be able to pull back on the input here. As long as you're not clipping into the plugin, you can crank it up or crank it down. It's better to increase the volume in post as long as you have enough headroom on the input. So consider just using this if you need to, but for the most part, if you're recording at proper levels, you really shouldn't need to adjust the input at all. It could just be helpful if you want to use it as some kind of effect or something. Like if you wanted to taper it off and then pull it up without having to adjust that on your guitar, that might be an ideal situation to use the input. Or if you get tracks that are really intense and you just don't want a clip gain, then you can always use the input, but I rarely touch that on my amp sims. Next to that is a gate. Setting the level of this gate in particular, this threshold will actually change the parameters of it. So the gate actually becomes more aggressive with its attack and release as you turn it clockwise. So if you were to be at say negative 20 dB on the gate, uh, it'll actually be more aggressive compared to if you're at like negative 60 dB, it'll be a lot less aggressive. So this isn't just a threshold on this sim, it's actually a threshold and an intensity knob for the gate itself. So if you find things are a little bit too sensitive, you might actually wanna back it up a bit and find the sweet spot overall because it may not do what you want it to if you're just thinking of it as a threshold. It will adjust the parameters in the background and you can't really adjust that, you just kinda of have to go with it. Hopefully that's not a deal breaker because otherwise this is a really good sim. After that, you have the stomp boxes, which are really just two distortions. You have the amp itself. You have the cabinet sim. You have four post effects. And you also have the output knob, which again, if you find yourself coming out too low or too hot, you can just use this as a final stage adjustment just to make sure that you're getting the level in your doll that you want on the bus that you have it on. You can bypass individual sections at will. Again, you don't have to go to the sections to bypass them. So you could turn off the cab, the effects, the amp or the stomp without switching to their page. But if you do, then you can actually see that the uh, cab will darken as will the amp, the amp will darken completely. But if you turn off the power here, then it doesn't turn off the entire uh, 
AMP page. So if you want to bypass the AMP as a whole, you can do that. If you want to turn off individual stomps, you can do them individually, or you could just bypass them both at the same time, and it'll leave your settings as is here. So when you turn that back on, it'll automatically have that back on. Very cool stuff. Just some, you know, nice quality of life options that are kind of sane defaults. Same with the cab. Cabs, you can do this to turn them off entirely, or you could turn off the IRs individually. So you got a lot of options there. With the uh, post effects, you could do the same. You can turn everything off, on or off individually, and turn off the entire effects screen so that once you turn that back on, all of your effects pop back on. So it's kind of like a global bypass for each of these individual screens, while also having bypasses on each individual uh item on each of those screens. Now then for the fun stuff. So the pedals, you don't actually get any unique effects. So you don't get like a phaser or a vibrato or a chorus or anything like that. But you do get these black country customs. Steel Park is an overdrive. And then the monolith is a distortion pedal. Let me just engage that and we can walk through the settings. So you'll notice that it gets really intense real fast. So these are the different knobs. D is drive. V is volume. B is bass. One thing to know is that when you're at five, you shouldn't be looking at the six here. You should be looking at the five, which has this little triangle here to show you what number it's on. Any of these knobs, the tooltip that hovers over it will show you what the number is actually on. Then you can double click on any of them to type in the number, or you can just drag it to your desire and it'll show you the tooltip the whole time. D is drive, V is volume. B is bass after the distortion. So you're not actually increasing the bass into the distortion. You're increasing it after the fact. And then T is actually the treble in post. So you're not actually increasing the bass or the treble going into the distortion. It's all after. So you could actually do this. And even though there's no drive going on, it still affects the post EQ after the pedal. So you can use this as a basic Baxendall type EQ going into the amp. If you just want to boost the highs or boost the lows in a cleaner way, you can actually do that. And that's pretty okay. So here are the different modes you've got. You've got the top one, which is mode one, the orange LED. I think it's kind of a red LED, but it shows the orange LED. That's considered a pre mid boost. So it's good for boosting those mids. Mode two over here, or the blue LED, is going to be your low mid boost. Notice how it kind of rounds out that like 400 hertz region. And then purple is just a clean overdrive. So you're not going to get any EQ boost. It's just going to be a uh, clean boost. So it has the least effect on the EQ curve if you use the purple LED, which is right down the middle. The monolith distortion pedal, this one is going to be a lot more aggressive. D stands for distortion. So as you dial in more gain, you're going to get more compression, more sustain out of it. R on this actually stands for range. This is going to do kind of the opposite of what B did. This one's actually going to adjust the low end going into the distortion. So if you increase this all the way to the top, you actually lose all your bass. You can actually clean up some of the muddier sound of that tone with this range knob, because if you go to zero, then it's not going to affect your tone at all. But if you go up to 10, you're going to lose a lot of low end. 
has it more or less just high passes before the distortion. So you hear that the distortion is now affecting more of the high end as opposed to being uh, a full range distortion. So from there, you've got the volume knob. And of course, the T, which is the treble. Again, the T is clean treble, so it's post EQ on the distortion, so it happens after the distortion. It doesn't go into the distortion. So that's a good thing to note if you're curious. Five is pretty much your uh, flat treble. So this is actually a treble reducer or a treble booster. And then this one's also got three modes. So you've got D1, which is going to be the heavily compressed distortion. So you're going to get more of a smooth sounding crunch. And then the blue LED or D2 is going to be more of a soft compression with uh, a lot more of an open distortion sound. Here how it kind of opens it up and takes less of a, uh, a crunch down on it and more of like a, an opening of the top end. I think that's a distinct enough tonal difference that you can really get a lot out of that. And then, of course, the purple LED is your traditional overdrive distortion. So you're basically going to be getting less compression. It's going to be more of a clean drive. So because it's more of a clean drive, you're not going to get as much of like a crushed sound you're just going to get a little bit more harmonic saturation on it. So you can actually also combine these. And use just the EQ from one of them like this and go into the distortion of the next one, at which point you can clean up the range beforehand and bring back some of the highs or smooth them out like so. So doing that kind of serial distortion with the slight adjustments to the EQ and choosing how compressed you want the distortion to sound is actually a lot more interesting than you would think it is. And it gives you a lot more power than you would imagine out of just two pedals. But they're there. They're really interesting sounding and you can get tons of crushed, uh, distorted and mangled sounds or you can get a really open, expressive, versatile and dynamic saturation. And I like that because the combination of those two things is pretty sweet. So you could honestly just give it like a little air boost with virtually no saturation, no distortion, but just enough to overdrive it ever so slightly and then round out the tone just real smooth like. So just tightening up the tone ever so slightly. So you can get just like a gently, gently push everything ever so slightly more and crank it up, give it a little bit more of like a smiley face. So. On to the next page. Next up, you get the amp. Now, this is the absolute piece de resistance. This is why you're here. So let's talk about it. Here, you have a pre-boost switch, which increases the input to the circuit, specifically to the preamp tubes, kind of like using a tube screamer. So this is kind of like a tube screamer boost without needing a tube screamer pedal, which is super helpful. It just works as like a straight clean boost. Notice how even a little bit does a whole lot. So if you were to push it really hard, you get a ton of distortion. Even having it on zero increases the jangle by focusing the tone a lot. So this pre-boost, because it's working straight to the input tubes, is going to make a difference when you engage it period. 
You got that on off switch and then you can adjust that as desired. You can switch between clean and rhythms here and it'll also change all of your tone stack options at which point the clean volume is supplanted by the rhythm volume. So now the clean volume does nothing and the rhythm volume is the volume control. Switching back to the clean, you get all of your EQ choices back for the clean channel and rhythm gain and rhythm volume do nothing. Clean and rhythm, this channel is just lead, the red channel, but the clean channel is green LED, whereas the rhythm channel is also green LED, but with this green LED turned off. So it's not like a uh, red, green, orange situation. It's actually more of like a green. And then if it's actually clean, it'll be green LED over here as well. One thing you'll notice is that this is like red. That's because the bass, middle and treble knobs can actually be pulled. You can push and pull the knobs with the right click button. And if it's pulled out, then it'll show you the red LED glow behind the knob, kind of like it does on the real amp. So when you pull the bass, this extends the low frequency response. So I believe it makes it more of a shelf, but makes it a shelf with like a wider cue. So you can pull up a lot more of that low end. The middle, you can actually lower the frequency range of the middle control so that it goes from being like a little bit higher in the mids to like down towards the fundamental a little bit more. So here it is without the pull. Here it is with the pull. It moves the mid switch down from like around one and a half K down to probably like 750 Hertz ish. So you can actually use this to pull really hard out some of that funk as well. If you feel like you got too much mid range going on, but you don't want to get rid of like the higher mid range. So it's really unique in that every single one of these has a switch that you can pull or push. And that's cool. Same thing with the treble switch. This, if you pull it out, you can actually broaden the treble frequency. So check this out. It really mellows out the overall cue. So because it widens the cue, it also brings stuff up from a little bit lower in the frequency spectrum as well as a little bit higher. So what it does is you can actually help with really thin sounding pickups, increase the treble around the actual point of the bell while fundamentally still bringing up the high end. But instead of just focusing on like that 2K, 4K area, it'll then focus on bringing up everything around those. So you get a little bit more of the 6K, you get a little bit more of like the 1K and that can help smooth out a bell significantly, which is awesome. I love that stuff. Now again, when you switch to just the rhythm channel, gain and the rhythm volume take over. Now this thing has a ton of gain on tap. It can get really intense real fast. You can really smash that signal. It's really good. So you can have a lot of dynamics or you can really crush it. Switch to the lead channel, the lead gain and lead volume take over. And anything you do to the clean volume, rhythm gain or rhythm volume will have no effect on the lead tone. Although you might not want to do that in case you want to switch channels. The lead channel is extremely high gain. At that point, you really don't need a pre-boost most of the time. And with the pre-boost no longer engaged, you get a lot more of a clean low end and a clean mid range. It's 
So after the initial tone stack stuff, you get all of these interesting knobs over here that really make the laneys unique. So first off, the dynamics knob. Turning this boy all the way to the right, all the way clockwise, will give you a lot fatter, looser low end. Like a really fat, wide low end. And if you turn it counterclockwise, that low end goes away and it tightens up the low end. So with maximum bass and maximum dynamics, it's all low end, baby. Listen how fat that gets. Now, contrary to that, this is actually a tone knob. So this kind of acts as a upper harmonic dampener or harmonic enricher. So if you were to turn this all the way here, You can actually control the top end response really easily. So if you feel like, oh, this is a great tone, I just wish it was a little bit brighter, turn it up a little and you'll get that brightness you're looking for. But if you feel like you need a real sludgy sound, blanket that baby. It's a great amount of control that you can use and it's a totally different mindset with, you know, the way you're thinking. But like this combination of dynamics and tone makes a huge difference and gives you a lot of sculpting possibility. Up next, we have this reverb knob. Let me turn it to clean so you can hear the reverb real easily. It sounds a little bit springy, but it also sounds kind of platey. It's probably like a, a simple design, if you will, for the reverb, but you can get a decent like wet tone out of that. And I like that. After that, you actually have the wattage, which is crazy. So this will adjust the signal level inside the power amp. So you can actually drive the uh, power amp really hard. And while it also acts as a volume control, you can actually use it to run the power tubes intensely hard. So this actually will act as like a master volume, but it'll saturate real nice. So if you really wanted to saturate and then just turn down the output volume. You can get it real clean or real dirty. So that's really up to you. It's a really interesting uh, addition there that is also on the real thing. And I really like how that goes. The lastly, the only other thing left on this boy is the power switch, which funny enough, turning off the power doesn't actually turn off the reverb. So it turns off everything but the reverb. So if you wanted to use the, just the reverb from this amp and use it with something else, you could theoretically, that's fine. Not sure why you'd want to do that, but if you really like that reverb, you can. Let's talk about the cab screen. So there's a lot going on here. This is like kind of overkill, right? It looks crazy. So what's going on here is you have these power switches here for the IRs so you can turn off one cab or the other. And now it's entirely this cab. You can turn off cabs entirely. You can switch to just that. You have this little slider here that'll allow you to switch between the cabs when you have two choices. Right now it's 62% this mic, 38% this mic, but that slider can't be moved if you have one IR or the other off because it only switches between channel A and channel B. You have that kind of power here. You also only have two cab options. You have the GS412 and the LA412. Basically, what that means is the Laney GS412, which is a cabinet loaded with custom designed drivers, the HH Customs. You're going to get regular 412. It's got an aggressive low, low mid. It's supposed to be very, very warm and clean with beautiful crunch and so on. 
compared to the LA 412s, which are the Laney Black Country LA 412s, which have Celestian G12s. So you're going to get the G12H speakers in it. It's going to be part of the Black Country Custom Series, kind of like the Stomps are. You know, your Celestian G12 sound in there. You can switch between the two. Of course, the LA-412 is going to be a little bit brighter because of the Celestians, whereas the uh, Custom is going to be a little bit darker. And it's going to have a slightly different frequency response. You're also going to notice that you can switch between the different microphones. You really only have four options here, though. You have a 421, a Ribbon 121, a 57, and a 47, which is going to be a condenser mic. And you can switch between them easily. You can adjust the position either with this slider, moving it further from the cap up to the edge of the cone, or you can click and drag it to do the same on the microphone so you can position it freely. You can pull out to adjust the distance or you can adjust the distance on the slider and you can adjust the angle of the microphone up to 55 degrees. So you can have it straight on, slight angle, freely up to 55 degrees. Really interesting that you actually have the ability to do that. A lot of uh, sims will only show axis on or off as an option, but this one lets you do a lot more than that. You can also choose to go into a folder and grab a custom IR. If you open an external IR, it'll actually still let you do the blend, but what it won't let you do is position a microphone. So it'll just be the custom IR that you can click on to switch it off, or you can click back on and it'll show you that there's an external IR. d microphone placement versus an ir just to blend in you can do that but then you lose any other control because it's just a stagnant ir but speaking of stagnant ir it's not actually a stagnant ir and here's why so you actually have this option of using bogren digital's irdx irdx is impulse response dynamics which is a proprietary bogren digital technology that allows you to quote unquote add dynamics and true to life speaker behavior to static impulse responses. As you're listening to it, you can adjust that and hear what it sounds like if you so choose. What it really does, it just feels kind of like you're getting a little bit more speaker breakup out of it, which I guess is fine. It makes it feel more realistic to some people, but not to everybody. I like it on. There's also this EQ air section here. So this is basically a seven kilohertz shelf. Which is nice. So uh, you can actually get the tonal character to really pop on IRs, especially if they're darker. And you can actually do some, anything in between to get more brilliance, more clarity out of it. Because unlike the tone knob, which is going to do more like harmonic enhancement, I'm fairly certain this is just an EQ shelf, just a, basically a presence knob. Since it's not on the amp itself, I figure they put it on the cab to make up for that. But it sounds good. I like it. So between those two things, you can get a lot of power. You can also export your own IR which is actually really easy. So you can take this combination and just straight up save it as an IR anywhere you want in a folder and load it later, which is pretty cool. I'm glad that it gives you the ability to do that. Now then, onto the effects chain. This is the final frontier as far as this plugin is concerned. So let's get right into it. This is an EQ, high pass, low pass, 10 band, based on probably just uh, an API because it looks like one. You got a range of 12 dB in either direction. 16K, 8K, 4K, you never need that. 2K, 1K, 500 Hertz, 250 Hertz, 125, 
63 hertz and 31 hertz. Pretty rare to get all the way down to 31 hertz on these particular kinds of plugins because they're usually for guitar tones, but you never know when you want some real low subharmonics. So you can turn that on and off with this button. Low pass goes down to 4K, up to 20 kilohertz, and the high pass goes from 20 hertz up to 600. So again, You can get that obligatory radio effect as everybody should have in their amp sim. And then after that, you actually have a limiter that works really cool. So this limiter is typical limiter ceiling. You get an input to push it harder or drive it more. And it smooths things out, right? Well, this is a low end control that I'm fairly certain works as a multi band compressor, a multi band compressor. So it'll actually adjust low end control level between 100 hertz and 250 hertz. So that's literally a multi band compressor. It'll show you these LED readouts to show you how much it's doing with no low end control. with tons. Goodbye 150 hertz to 200 hertz. But that low end control knob helps so much, especially for chuggier stuff. This is a godsend. And the fact that it's such a simple limiter is amazing. I love how much control you get out of this because you can really boost that volume and control the low end all in one tool. Phenomenal. I love it. You also have a delay, which has a mix knob, a feedback knob, anything over 90 gets self oscillating. So it doesn't self oscillate after 50. It goes after 0.9. You can also adjust the time. Low pass, just the affected signal down to about four kilohertz and high pass up to 600. So you can really focus it in. You have the option to adjust the timing up down to one sixteenth note and all the way up to a half note. You have a switch to change it from tempo synced to milliseconds so you can make it a specific millisecond time. All the way up to two seconds and all the way down to 20 milliseconds. You can also do a slap back delay. Which is a classic. And then you have a digital delay. Slap back actually takes away your ability to tempo sync and only lets you use a millisecond sync. Between 60 milliseconds and 150 milliseconds, just because that is typical slapback time. And then the digital gives it right back to you. So you can go back to your tempo sync again. And your millisecond sync can go from 20 milliseconds up to two seconds once again, anytime you're in an analog or digital. So just keep that in mind. If you want to slap back, it's a very specific technique and a very specific tool. The only weird thing is that the volume gets a little bit strange. It doesn't have automatic gain correction. So blending the mix in, you're going to have to adjust your output gain to compensate. The reverb is also very simple, so you can adjust the size from really small room to massive room. You can adjust the pre-delay from 10 milliseconds up to 500 milliseconds, which is half of a second. Pretty wild. You can adjust the width from super stereo down to super mono, which sounds great because it doesn't get in the way of the sides. 
Again, I love mono reverb on stereo guitars. It just sounds really good. But again, you don't get any gain compensation here that's automatic. So as you increase the mix, it kind of falls out of that range of output that you had before. So not a lot of options as far as the reverb goes, but it sounds good enough to use in a mix and you can always turn it off, try it again, adjust some things. You know, you could do anything you need to to make it sound the way you want. So that is all of the features. Now let's go through and listen to this song where I used every single tone, this particular amp sim, the Laney Ironheart from Aurora DSP. I'm going to pull up the preset and I'm going to go track by track and show you guys the variety of tones I was able to get with this sim. So you're going to hear a breakup, then crunch, then you're going to hear some cleans. You're going to get to hear some heavy tones. And then of course, you're going to get to hear the jaunt. So let's start from the beginning. This is humility is the flesh of life and the gasp of plenum again. So as you can tell, this is really good at heavy tones. <laughs> this is really a, a very aggressive amp sim that you can get some fantastic cleans with. Don't get me wrong. You can get some really good, pretty clean sounds with it, but it's really tailored for aggression, for heavy, for punch, if you will. So let me actually save that last one as filled jaunt. So you can get a lot of great tones out of this. I personally am actually a really big fan of the Laney Ironheart series as a whole. It's one of my favorite amps. And I was really excited to see that Aurora came out with it. When I got the chance to play with it, it really did fulfill my dreams. And honestly, the stomps were like way extra. Like I didn't need much. I know you will I am super excited just to have the amp, let alone two great pedals that have fantastic tonal variation, two great cabs, the ability to load custom IRs, IRDX built right into it, some air, some great EQ, some powerful limiter. All the rest of this is icing on the cake because at the end of the day, this is a fantastic amp that has been modeled beautifully by Aurora DSP and I am a huge fan of where they went with this. I'm so excited to finally have a Laney Ironheart to play with in the box, and I'm gonna be using this plugin quite a bit. With that in mind, hopefully I didn't bore you guys. I hope you guys got something out of it and learned maybe a thing or two. I know I had fun. So thank you guys for watching. Feel free to like, comment, and subscribe, and leave any comments specifically about what you want me to review, or let me know something that you learned that you might not have known right out of the gate. If you want to buy this plugin, if you already have this plugin, whatever, let me know. In the meantime, I'm Phil Zio. This is One Wall Studio. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you guys next time.
Bye.